Sure exciting. Sure excited to hear how it all goes. You know, there's a lot of lot of preparation, a lot of planning that goes into this, and and uh, there's a number of people that are going. So it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. Hey, sad news this last week, at least for us, is Billy Graham passed away and went to be with Jesus. Uh, I'm assuming he knew the Lord. <laughs> Good assumption, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, my uh, my dad. Uh, you know, was a, was a God fearer. My 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 father was a God fearer. My mother was a God fearer, and and um, but uh, in in early seventies, my parents took me to um, Portland Coliseum, and so our whole family went to the Portland Coliseum to hear Billy Graham and to a Billy Graham crusade. And my I remember my father uh, walking forward, and um, you know he knew the Lord. He was a God fearer, as I said, but. From that day on, he became a God follower. And there's a difference. There's a difference between a God fearer and a God follower. There's a lot of Christians that are God fearers, but they're not necessarily following the Lord. And so my father, uh, from that time on, was really a God follower. And uh, owe a lot to Billy Graham, you know, just the, the simplistic message that God loves you and that you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven. I mean, that is just it. He didn't care who he offended. He didn't care what everybody you know else was doing that was what he came to do and man did he do it well uh when when we go to heaven we'll see him i just hope that when we're standing before the great white throne of judgment that i am not after him you know what i'm hearing you you hear what i'm saying i don't want to be after or i don't want to be after mother Teresa or the apostle paul let me let me go after somebody else okay you know because they'll read all the things that billy graham did and it'll just be this long list and then I'll stand there and they go, well, he had a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. That's about his contribution to the the kingdom of God. So I just don't want to go after someone like that because, wow. Hey, uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk to you today about suffering, struggles, problems, issues, pain, whatever you want to call it. We all got it. We all go through it. Um, But uh, I want to read you a story. Uh, This comes from the book of John. And it's the story about Jesus. In fact, the story we're going to be talking about today. So uh, bear with me while I put on my glasses so I can see. I'm, I'm, I'm at that age where I need glasses to read. <clears throat> I, my arms aren't long enough anymore for the menus. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to read the menu. Why do we use such fine print? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> As he went along... He, this being Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. Just think about it. From birth, all the darkness. Never never seeing anything. Didn't know what the color blue looked like. Didn't know, didn't know that the sky was blue and didn't know what the color red was. You know, nothing. Okay? Blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, which means teacher, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, Jesus continued, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming. Night had already been for this guy all his life. But night is coming when no one can work. While while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, He spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Well, he was blind. I mean, I don't know if that guy knew what he was doing. You know, I mean, just think about it. Jesus spits in the ground and takes his finger and makes mud with his spit. And puts it on this guy, wipes it on this guy's eyes. I mean, that's just gross. I mean, I'm just, just from a human standpoint, you're thinking, Jesus, wasn't there another way? I mean, couldn't, but then, you know, I got to thinking about it. I don't think that guy cared after he saw. Because then Jesus said, go, he told him, after he 
makes these two mud spit cakes on his eyes, says, go and wash. And the man came home seeing. I suppose, as I was thinking about it, that guy didn't care after he saw. So I was thinking about it last night when I was going to sleep. And I said, Lord, spit on my knee. God, spit on my back. Lord, spit on my shoulder. I ask God to spit on my sons, to spit on my wives. I ask God to spit on you last night. I did. I was praying for God to spit on this church, whatever it takes. If, it, if, if spitting on my knee heals my knee, or if spitting on my back heals my back, or if spitting on this church heals this church, or if spitting on you were to heal you, then spit away, Lord. Spit away. Right? They didn't applaud in the first service for that. I want you to know. You guys have a lot, just a deeper insight into Christ that you would applaud there. Way to go. Don't tell the first service I said that, but they were lacking, sorely lacking. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging said, isn't this the same guy who used to sit and beg? Some claim he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself says, I'm the guy, I'm the man. How then were your eyes open? They demanded. He replied, this man, they called Jesus, made some mud and put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Salome and wash, so I went and washed, and now and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked. He said, I don't know. He was blind when he went. It wasn't until he got to the pool of Salome and washed his eyes that he could see. So he's blind. He didn't know where he is. Now, now there's a twist to the story here. It's going to get bad. This is going to turn ugly. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Oh, no. You're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received the sight. Who put mud on my eyes? The man replied. And I, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I can see. And some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. The Jews still not, did not believe that he had been blind from birth and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one who, who you say was born blind? How is it he can see? We know he's our son. We know he was born blind, but how he can see and who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, the Pharisees. For already the, the Jews, the Pharisees had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, get this, anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be kicked out of church. He'd be put out of the synagogue. That's why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Talking about Jesus. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I see. Then they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've already told you, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> then they hurled insults at him. Because when you don't have an argument... You just call people names. You are his fellow. You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, unschooled, never read, born blind. Now that's remarkable, he says. You don't know where he comes from, yet he's opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to godly men who does his will. The guy's got already pretty deep nobody's ever heard of opening the, the eyes of a man born blind if this man were not for god from god he could do nothing so he says to the pharisees to this they replied you were steeped at sin from birth 
From birth? Steeped in sin. From birth. A little baby? Sinner, steeped in sin. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Kicked out of church. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now remember, he's never seen Jesus. Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, the one you now see. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. This is a story we're going to talk about a little bit today. And it has to do with suffering. has to do with struggle. has to do with pain. And um, the problem is, when we go through struggling, something happens to us. But this happened, the pain, the struggle, the blindness, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. But here's the, here's the thing when, us, when we're going through struggles, you're going through pain, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's on your job, whether it's in your finances, whatever, physically, emotionally, mentally, I'm going to get to all that. But when you're going through something, here's the tendency, point the finger. But does it help? Will pointing the finger help? The story I just read, there were several people that were pointing the finger. The, fair, or the, the disciples, the first ones. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Pointing the finger. And then the townspeople. Is that the guy? That's not the guy. That's, no, he wasn't. That's not the guy. No, and, he's, and the, 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 the blind guy said, yeah, I am the guy. And then the Pharisees. Who, who did this? Who did this? And then his parents, hey, don't ask us, ask him, ask him, ask him. And then the Pharisees again, what do you have to say about this? And then they hurling insults at him, and you're steeped in sin from birth. All this pointing the finger, all this pointing the finger. For what? What good does it do? The only one who can point the finger is Jesus. And he doesn't point the finger. He uses his finger to make mud from his saliva and put it on the guy's eyes. Fingers are made for helping. Not pointing at at people. Fixing blame. See, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. Jesus wasn't good. The man wasn't calling out to Jesus for help. And Jesus, we don't know if he was going to help him or not. Jesus didn't heal everybody he saw because some people weren't asking. It was the disciples who brought his attention to this man. But they did it in a way of finding blame, of of pointing the finger. Who sinned, Rabbi, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That's what brought Jesus' attention to the guy. And Jesus says, I'm not going to point the finger at the guy. I'm going to use my fingers to heal him. Sad. It's so sad that the first thing these disciples uh, said is, who sinned? But isn't that kind of, I mean, I've done it. I've done it. See somebody that's, that's struggling with something? And you kind of, what's their problem? What did they do? What did they do to deserve that? It's really what they were saying. What did he do to deserve that? Their initial reaction, like so many of us, is to find fault. Somebody has to pay for this. Somebody has to take the fall. Somebody has to be blamed. And once we fix blame, then we feel better about ourselves because it wasn't us. That's what fixing the blame, pointing the fingers is all about. It's not me. It's you. And you know who we point the finger at a lot? God. We point the finger at God. We point the fingers at others. Now, it's natural, though. I mean, let's, let's just call it what it is. It is natural when something bad or painful happens to us. We want to know why. Why did this happen to me and I'm such a good person? Or how? How could this happen to me when I, I didn't deserve this? Well, sometimes deserve's got nothing to do with it. See, we live under this notion We live under this Western thinking, this Western civilized thinking that says, that basically says this. Bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. Right? If you're bad, bad things will happen. Well, that is true. You do reap what you sow. It is a biblical principle. But not exclusively. 
not exclusively. Because bad things happen to bad people, and bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. Read Psalm 73. Asaph was going crazy, almost lost his faith in God because of the prosperity of the wicked. David wrote about it in Psalms. Why is this, Lord, that people that don't love you, that don't follow you, that don't call on you are rich? It's not fair. Because good things happen to bad people. And bad things happen to bad people. And bad things happen to good people like you. But good things happen to you as well. See, it rains on both the righteous and the unrighteous, Jesus said. And sometimes when it's raining, you're indoors and you don't get wet. And sometimes it's raining and you do get wet. But righteous or unrighteous, deserving or undeserving, really isn't the point. But we like to point the finger. We want to know, too, when it's going to be over. And those aren't easy questions to answer. Those are questions only God knows the answer to. It's so easy to focus on the why and the how, the blame, that we forget the real important question. And Jesus addresses it. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, neither. He said, neither. But I'm going to tell you the who here. Jesus says, I'm going to tell you the real important question that needs to be asked. And that's that the work of God might be displayed in his life. That's what's the most important thing to Jesus. Is not who, why, or not how. It's about God. It's about God. What, what if Jesus could open up our perspective a little bit about our problems, about our pain, about our aches, about our suffering. What if God, what if God, if we handled it the way He would want us to, if we look to Him, what if God could turn our mess into a message? What if God could turn our test into a testimony? What if God could take our history and turn it into His story? of work in our life. This man could now have a testimony. He didn't just have sight. He had a story to tell. A story of Jesus healing him. A story of Jesus doing something in his life. And was able to declare him a prophet and then declare him as Lord and worship him. And truly, not just physically see, but truly see, what if every person you know, including, including you, every person in this room, every person in this town, this community, in Hollister and San Martin and Morgan Hill, every person in San Jose, the Silicon Valley, every person in the state of California and in the United States of America and every person in this world is suffering, struggling, in pain, having a difficulty with something. We don't always see it, but they're, they're suffering from something or with something. Every human being. Everyone you know. It could be physical. Lots of aches and pains. Sometimes you don't even do anything. When, you just, when you're getting old, sometimes you just wake up and you're sore and you don't even know what you did. I didn't do anything yesterday. How could I be sore? You slept wrong. I slept wrong. I was asleep. How do I... I mean, how can sleeping hurt? It didn't... I never faced that when I was younger. I mean, when I was sore, it was because I was doing something the day before. But you just... Things just don't work. All of a sudden, you're like, what happened? Everything was fine. And now... When did this... What? Maybe it's mental. I mean, there's people that are just struggling mentally. Last week, someone in our church had a stroke. And, you know, their mind is affected by that. There's people that are struggling mentally with their past, and it torments them. 
just torments them or past things that happen that torment them mentally, emotionally then. You know, sometimes wires just aren't connected right. It doesn't seem like they're connect, connected right. Relational pain. I mean, my goodness, we've got, we got, not one of us here had perfect parents. Some of us had good parents. Some of us had bad parents. But none of us had good, perfect parents. We had, we have kids. Now, they came from us. So the gene pool may not be that deep in some cases. And, and we got struggles with them. We got sometimes struggles with our boss or coworkers or employees. Struggle with our, with our wife or our husband or our ex or our neighbors. I mean, there's just all kinds of relational problems that we can have and pain. And then finances, money. Money can be something that really causes a lot of fear and anxiety in people. But we all have pain of one kind or another from one thing or another. What are we going to do about it? See, there's many solutions, quote unquote. People out of their pain, mental, emotional, physical, turn to drugs. I have a dear friend in the ministry. Had some physical pain. Started taking prescribed medication. Became an addict. Out of the ministry. Lost his marriage. I mean, this is a man that loved Jesus. Loved Jesus. Mark Stewart, you know him. Mark and I spent some time with him. And all he had, he had a surgery, and there was complication from the surgery, and more complications, and he started taking meds. Solution, doctor prescribed, couldn't get off him. Started taking an alternate when he couldn't get any more prescriptions. I mean, people turn to all kinds of things out of their pain, out of their struggle, out of their suffering. But there is no better solution than Jesus. Now, I'm not down on medicine, man. You need it sometimes. I mean, I, thank God for doctors and nurses and, and pharmacists and chemists. Thank God for people that can help us in times of pain. But... Alcohol and drugs and extramarital affairs and, and pornography and, and, you know, buyings, going on spending sprees to help, you know, buy stuff. Sometimes people use food as, as a way to, to cope. These coping mechanisms for our pain aren't solutions. Jesus is the only answer, the real answer for our struggles. He's the one that can make the blind see with spit. I mean, that's just cool. That's what I'm saying. Jesus spit all over me if you need to. Because I want to be healthy. I want to be healed. I want to be strong. I want to be good. And I want to help. I, I don't want to hurt people. I want to help people. He's our answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. He is the answer for your life. He is the answer for your finances. Not taking more shifts. I'm, I'm all for work. you got to work hard. but And we got to work hard, but... You got to pray about your job. You got to pray about your clients. You got to pray about your struggles with the, with work. You got to lay your finances before the Lord and say, "God, spit on my money. Help, help me." I mean, He's the answer for it all. And when it comes to suffering, pointing the finger isn't going to help. But I'm going to tell you what: faith in God. Faith in God is what's going to change things. He's the answer. Jesus finally finds him, as I read. You believe in the Son of Man, Jesus says to the guy. Who is he? Who is he? Tell me, so that, so that I may believe. I think that you could argue here that faith is is the most important thing. Your faith in God. Billy Graham passed away. It doesn't matter how many presidents he counseled. They said he, he counseled presidents from Eisenhower all the way through. Even in 2013, he sat for uh, uh, an extended time with current President Donald Trump. 
Didn't even know Trump was going to be president, but God knew. He met, he's met with every president since Truman. He's, he's met with famous people. He's been America's pastor. He, I mean, he spoke to, to, to thousands and thousands at a time. None of that matters now. His faith in God is all that matters. His faith in Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, is all that matters now. There are lots of healthy, wealthy, and quote-unquote wise, educated, smart people in this world who have absolutely no relationship with God. And what does it get them? Jesus said this. I read this just the other day in, in the book of Luke. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What does it profit you? What does it profit you if you make millions of dollars and you don't know Jesus Christ? What does it profit if you're the sexiest man alive voted by whatever magazine, People Magazine or whatever, or the, the hottest chick in the world. What does it matter? 20, 30 years from now, we're going to look at you and go, <laughs> you need more makeup. <laughs> Slather it on. Right? Because what do we know about beauty and, 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 and being handsome? It fades. It fades. I'm living test. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> What do you know about handsome? All right. <clears throat> Circus mirrors. Okay, that's all I got to say. All right. All that stuff. Money, money, it can go like that. It can go like that. You can lose it all in a, in a heartbeat. But then there are a lot of really poor people who are hurting, who are living in pain but seem to have a deep connection with the Lord. Right? It's hard. It's hard to be a missionary and bring the gospel to countries like Norway and Sweden and Switzerland. Places where people have money doing well. But boy, you go down to Costa Rica and you put out a tent and you say, we'll pray for you and we'll give you some soup and you'll have thousands coming because they need help and they know it. They need someone. Which would you prefer? This is a real question for you. Is your faith in God more important than stuff? Is your faith in God more important than work? Is your faith in God more important than money? It's true. We can have both. I know people that, that have a lot and love God a lot. There are people that, that are like that. There are people that are able to do it. To love God and, and with all their heart and work hard and, and honor Him with their money and honor Him with their time and honor Him with their gifts. It is possible. But given the choice, God is real. All this other stuff is not really real. It comes and goes like... I've told many stories. I, I've told this story before, but there was a couple in our church at Williams, Arizona. And when you would see them, you could just feel the dark cloud of depression on this couple. And I, I started ministering to them. In fact, he's... He's the one guy, he's the first guy when I got there, he, he, t he came to me uh, and, and he said, look, it's August, we need to get some wood for you. So we're going to cut wood. August in Williams, Arizona is wood cutting month. Because you've got to stockpile between five and seven cords of wood for the, sun, for the winter. Because it starts snowing. Well, we had four seasons in Williams, Arizona. We had... Winter and June, July, and August. Those were your four seasons. Okay? So, so we went out, and we started talking, and I started ministering, and then I was counseling him and his wife. They received a huge inheritance. Like, we're talking big number. Okay? A few million. And this was about, I think it was five or six million dollars, something like Big, big money. I mean, I was like, really? You have any left, you know? But, no, they didn't. 
They didn't. In about three years' time, they blew through it. They blew through it. They invested here. They invested there. They helped this guy. They bought a little of this. Thought this would help. And it just went, just gone. And there was a, there was a dark cloud of depression over this couple that loved Jesus, but they felt that God would never bless them again because they spoiled their inheritance. Money's not real. Looks aren't real. Sometimes our jobs aren't even real. God is real and he's everlasting. And that's what Billy Graham is, is experiencing now, that, that the faith he put in Christ is everlasting. It's not going away. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. God can take whatever you're going through, whatever pain, struggle, situation, suffering, and he can work it for good in your life. He's able. But we've got to call on him. I just wrote a letter yesterday. You're going to be getting it next week. In Psalms chapter 61, verse 2, David said this, I call from the ends of the earth. I cry. I call out as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that's higher than I. In other words, this is what David is saying. I'm at the end of my road. I'm at the end of my ropes. And I've come to the end of myself. And I need help. He was at the end of his road and then he was calling from the ends of the earth. He had no more options, no place to turn. He was at the end of the ropes and then he was, he was faint. He was calling as his heart was growing faint. He was at his wit's end. He was, at, he was done with himself and done trying to help himself. And he called out to the Lord. God is able to turn whatever you're going through. He's able to turn it around for his good, your good and his glory. Think about it. This man was born blind. That's not good. I don't think anybody would want that. I wouldn't want that for anybody. Well, I can think of a few people. Wait a minute. Hold on. I don't want to think about them right now. I don't think I'd want that for anybody. That's not a good thing. But Jesus, in the sense of saying this is for a greater good, whatever you're going through, it could be for a greater good. What if your marital problems, you reach out to God and God turns your marriage around and you're able to help other couples that are struggling. What if, you're, what if your struggle with alcohol or drugs, you turn that over to the Lord, He begins to work in your life, and the next thing you know, you're counseling and sponsoring people out of addiction. Wow, oh, I mean, what could God do? See, it would seem to me that bringing glory to God is even more important than our sight. Than something physical. It's the most important thing you have. Treasure it. Treasure it. Work it out. Build your faith. Build your faith. It's the most important thing you have. Your faith in God is what's going to get us, it's what's going to get you through everything. It's the only, He and our faith in Him is the only thing that's going to get us through this world and in the kingdom of heaven. But it all depends on how you look at life. How are you looking at it? How are you looking at your problems? Are you defeated by them? Or are you saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, I got this going on. I've got a lot of disadvantage in my life, but I have God. I have God. I think God's just waiting us, to, waiting for, for us to say that to him. Like David did. I may not have this, and I may not have that. You may not have the house you want. You may not be driving the car that you want. You may not have the job that you want. You may not have the finances you want. Your marriage may not be where you want it to be, or your kids may not be where you want them to be. But you have God. You have the most important person. You have God. But it's all how you look at things. And this blind man saw life different from then on. Not just physically, but in all areas of life. What if all your struggles and your suffering came so that your faith in God grew? What if? What if? Guess what the last word is? Would it be worth it? Yeah. It would. It'd be worth it. It'd be worth it. You should bow your heads. I do pray that your pains are alleviated. I do pray that your struggles are coming to an end. 
I do pray that your suffering would come to a close in the name of Jesus. By his power, he is the God who heals us. I do pray that. But I also want you to see that what you're going through right now, there's a deeper purpose. There's a greater meaning. Find it. Find it. So that, so that this is all for his glory and not for naught. It would be terrible for you to go through pain and not learn the lesson that you were to learn and have to go through it again. Connect with God through your pain. Let me tell you, it's not about pointing the the finger. It's not that God... You're not going through this because God is mad at you. Man, somebody needs to hear that. That is a word from the Lord to somebody out there. You are not going through this pain. You are not going through this struggle. You are not going through this suffering because God is upset with you. And you're not cursed of God. You are His child. Parents, good parents don't curse their children. Good parents don't wish evil on their children. And He's not... A good parent. He's a perfect parent. That's not, that's not how God works. You haven't been turning to the Lord through this because you feel you're under a curse. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Stop thinking that way. In the name of Jesus. Lift your eyes to your helper. Lift your eyes to the Lord and say, God, I don't believe you're cursing me. I believe you want to bless me and I ask you for help with this. Give me the strength and the healing or whatever it takes. Spit on me, Lord, if that's what it takes. Father, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. See you later. Read your letter that's coming.